Hi, Paul from Paul's Passing Thoughts here. I want to make a quick little video clip here to answer a question received on um, my blog by a Calvinist who comes by frequency, frequently. Excuse me. Uh, he says, uh, Paul, I know you won't post this, but I would really like to know what Calvinist states that Christ obeys for believers in sanctification. Perhaps it is simply your unorthodox uh, use of terminology that is the problem. Uh, no, actually, I stay away from Reformed Orthodoxy altogether. Okay, Orthodoxy is um, the interpretation of truth by philosopher kings passed on to the uh, great unwashed masses. Okay, that's what orthodoxy is. Um, in ancient times, we called it mythology. All right, uh, but I, uh, that's a digression. But that makes, he says, but that makes no sense at all from a Calvinistic point of view. Okay, so his contention is, is that, you know, there aren't any Calvinists um, out there saying it. It's the way I'm using the terminology. Okay, well, let's look at that. Let's start with the Journal of Modern Ministry written by Calvinists. Okay, Senior Editor J. Adams. And let's go to a book review by Don Arms concerning... Um, let me see here. Um, that's Apparent Danger. Here we go. How People Change. Okay, let me adjust my camera here a little bit. There we go, that's a little better. Um, Don Arms concludes, a Calvinist, concludes his review of the book by saying the following. How People Change is a pronounced departure from the traditional, um, from the traditional or neuthetic model of biblical change. I agree with that statement. It states by, oh, I'm sorry, it starts by um, synthesizing justification and sanctification, all right, and narrows our role in uh, spiritual growth to faith and repentance only. You hear that? That's a Calvinist writing here. Their model presents, that is Paul David Tripp and Tim Lane and how people change, their model presents the Bible as a gospel narrative to the exclusion of all other uh, purposes. The authors, of, uh, the authors of HPC present a strange picture of believers who are still dead in trespasses and sins while being indwelled um, by Christ, who is the only life within us. That's what I used to believe that they believe, but I no longer believe that. Christ isn't really in us at all. We only experience him. But anyway, Don Arms continues. And therefore, the only one uh, working in the change uh, process, that would be Christ. Do you hear that? His um, suspicion is of this book in his book review is the only one working in the change process is Christ and not us. All right, this is a Calvinist talking. Accordingly, uh, total uh, dependence on Christ is the key to real change. Okay, But how does this work itself out in the Christian life? And he asked, a Christ who obeys for us? All right. Um, then he goes on to say, again, a Calvinist speaking, Christ referred uh, to the Holy Spirit as our helper. All right. And he gets into that. Um, you know, we're not potted plants in the process. The Holy Spirit is our, is our helper. He does not do it all for us. Okay, well, that's uh, from the Journal of Modern Ministry. That's a Calvinist on 
another Calvinist, Paul David Tripp. All right. Now, um, to that point, let's talk about uh, Paul David Tripp. This is from um, How People Change. Okay, page uh, the um, Punch Press 2006. Let's go to page 215, where Tripp says, um, "When when <clears throat> when we think, desire, speak, or act in a right way, it isn't time to pat ourselves on the back or cross it off our to-do list. Each time we do what is right." We are experiencing, okay? Experiencing. What does experience mean? When you experience something, are you necessarily doing it? No, okay? We are experiencing what Christ has supplied for us, okay? So, again, I've written about this before. Um, it's like standing in the rain. We're experiencing it but it's not us doing it, all right? Um, this is the Christian Faith, a Systematic Theology. Um, this is Michael Horton, Michael Horton. Um, you know, this reader wants examples of, of Calvinists who state this. Well, we have a Calvinist stating it about a Calvinist, and now we're on our second uh Calvinist that actually states stuff in Michael Horton's uh, Systematic Theology and on page 661 uh, we find the following. Progressive sanctification has two parts. Okay, uh, mortification and vivification. Both of which happen let me adjust this here a little bit better. To us. You got that? Alright. Progressive sanctification happens to us. It doesn't happen by us. It happens to us. Uh, by participation in Christ. What's that? That's the vital union. Okay. Uh, the vital, vital union. All right. Um, as Calvin notes, oh, okay, John Calvin, that's a Calvinist, right? Uh, Michael Horton is saying about John Calvin, these occur simultaneously, that is, mortification and vivification, and continuously throughout the Christian life, um, rather than in stages. Now, if we go down a little bit, he explains that, okay? Uh, he says, sub, uh, we subjectively uh, experience. We are, um, he says, we continue to struggle inward with what? Obedience? No. Our new identity is what we struggle with, okay? Not anything we do. We're merely uh, struggling with our new identity, okay? So, um, uh, we're, uh, as we do that, we're subjectively, again, experiencing this definitive reality. So, again, let me throw in here, according to Calvinism, the average Christian, uh, this is an aside, but it's important to know, the average Christian cannot interpret reality, okay? We are only subjectively experiencing the works of Christ, um, uh, which is a definitive reality. We can only experience the definitive reality subjectively. What's he saying there, in essence? That the average Christian cannot define reality, okay? Or the definitive gospel or definitive truth, all right? Um, and this ministry talks about these sorts of things all the time. All right, so we're signified and sealed to us um, in our baptism uh, requires a daily dying and raising. So that's what they call uh, sanctification, a, a subjective, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, 
uh, it requires a daily baptism um, or a daily dying and rising. And then he says, um, this is what the Reformers, this is Michael Hart Horton talking, a Calvinist, this is what the Reformers meant by sanctification as a living out of our baptism. So it's not anything we're doing, we're, just, we're living out the, the sum and total of our Christian life is this participation in Christ of mortification and vivification. And we've looked at the, the cross charts constantly where, you know, we don't get bigger, the cross gets bigger. So obviously, we're not doing anything. Okay, that's that. And then we'll conclude with, okay, let's conclude with, uh, let me see here, get this thing going here, oops, I'm sorry. Do, 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 do. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm -hmm. All right. Let's look at the gospel call and true conversion by the heretic Paul Washer. All right. Um, let me see here. All right. He states in this uh, book. Um, at conversion, a person begins to see God in himself as never before. Okay? Uh, this, this great revelation of God's holiness and righteousness leads to a great, greater revelation of self. Alright? Um, which in turn results in a repentance of brokenness over sin. Alright? Nevertheless, the believer is not left to despair. This is right out of the Heidelberg Disputation. All right? For he is also afforded a great revelation of the grace of God in the face of Christ, which leads to joy unspeakable. So, basically, we find a joy um, in seeing ourselves uh, for, in a clear and clear way of how evil we are. Um, this cycle, what is a cycle, okay, uh, simply repeats itself throughout the Christian life. You got that? All right. Um, as the years pass, the Christian sees more of God and more of self. So it's not anything we do. Our whole, the whole sum and substance of, of the Christian life is a sing, okay? Is a sing. The results are, are a sanctification that is done to us and not by us, okay? Resulting in a greater and deeper, what's the result? Us obeying? No, it results in a greater and deeper brokenness. Um, so we're at the same time um, broken and uh, joyful, okay? This is right out of the, the Heidelberg Disputation and right out of John Piper's Christian Hedonism. It's all the same stuff. All right. Uh, the heretic Paul Washer then goes on to say, Yet, all the while, the Christian joy uh, grows in equal measure because he is privy to greater and greater revelations of the love, grace, and mercy of God in the person and work of Christ. Not only this, so basically, the only way we can see God's grace is a constant dwelling on how evil we are. Is that what the New T Bible t t um, teaches us? You know, enough with these people already, okay? Um, if, if you're in a, in a brick and mortar, I'm, I'm just going to say it. Dear Christian, if you're in a brick and mortar church, uh, for all practical purposes in the United States right now, I have one thing to say to you. Come out from among them uh, and be separate, Okay. Great interchange, he goes on to say, occurs in that the Christian learns to rest less and less in his own performance. So as a Christian, 
the the in sanctification our goal is to to we don't necessarily rest um we're not resting in our own works in sanctification we work to please jesus christ but anyway we rest more and more in what he's saying confidence in our own performance and more and more in the perfect work of christ thus his joy is not only increased but it also becomes more consistent and stable he has uh, left uh, the the Christian has left off putting confidence in the flesh. So any effort on our part is just outright confidence in the flesh. Okay, is what he's saying. It's all back to this either or outlook of reality. Uh, if if you have any confidence at all that you can do anything for Jesus Christ because you're born again, you have God's seed within you, and you are now His son through a literal new birth and a new creature head if if you think that because of that you have any confidence in what you can do for christ that's adultery okay period and is resting in the virtue and merits of christ which is true christian piety so true christian piety is um resting only in the merits of christ uh in sanctification um, merits, well, he doesn't mean Christ's obedience to the cross only. He, he's talking about, like all Calvinists, Christ's obedience to the law. So basically, they get around Paul's assertion that there is no law that can give life uh, uh, get to, that can give life in justification by saying, oh, the law can give life because Christ kept the law for us and fulfilled it for us, so now the law can give life. Uh, it, it's backdoor work salvation, um, keeping ourselves saved by um, living this Gnostic existence of gospel contemplationism. That's what it is in a nutshell. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day.